This is Ricky Lee Jones. And Russ Teitelman. Jazz is not what you think. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> First, I'd like to say welcome, Ricky Lee Jones. Uh, I'm a huge fan. Um, Thank you. You're an inspiration for me. Um, it's one of the reasons I got into this business. Uh, when you, it seems like forever, but your first, your debut album, I think you were around 25 years old when that came out? 24. Uh, 24, and, um, and I was inspired. I was inspired because I talked to Kenny Loggins about this the other day. There was kind of a zeitgeist going on back then where you had these recording and performing artists that, that seemed to gravitate to some of these wonderful jazz musicians that were performing on those records. And it created a certain sound and a genre that has been imitated but yet to be replicated. Uh, it was a great time for music and your debut album was certainly on the top of my list. Um, come full circle with your latest album, it's almost back to the future. <laughs> I, 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 I totally agree with Russ uh, when he talks about there's a, a track on the, on the debut album. Uh, is, it, is it country? I think it's called Country. And, um, and it, when I first listened to it, I wasn't thinking of you as a jazz singer. But when I heard that song, it was undeniable that you were a jazz singer. And, and the journey that you've taken since then, and I've followed every record, uh, has been a tortuous one where you've gone so many different places, but now you're back to that song and that the beauty of the song. And I, want, I was gonna save this for the end, but I wanna pose this question to you because I feel it in your music now, and that is now, so many years later, you create this wonderful new album. And you wrote a note that talked about giving. And you talk about the, I guess, the lessons we've all learned in life about the importance of giving. Can you comment on that and how that has helped your musical journey? I can. First, I'm going to address the song and Russ's uh, impression of that song. So that song is called Company. 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 And... Um, so he said to me in this last year when we reunited our friendship and, and uh, rekindled our friendship, um, he said, when I first heard Company, it reminded me of Roberta Flock. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the most insightful things anybody has ever said to me because I've always considered myself a fine singer and my... Um, my first love is jazz, but I can, I can sing anything because I'm a singer, right? But there's a kind of singing that I don't do. And it's the, for me, it's the very trained, oversung thing that a lot of people love, but I just don't dig it. And um, so when I hear Roberta Flock, I hear a woman who's a singer who, and she probably, you know, definitely had a teacher, but the voice that I hear is not, um, is not trained. It's right from the source of her intention. And sometimes when people have too many teachers, it impedes that natural thing. So I had an untrained voice, but I understood what he was saying when he said, you are like Roberta Flack. Because when Roberta Flack sang, um, the first time ever I saw your face, you know, for months, it was all anybody wanted to listen to. It was so simple and unaffected, not even vibrato, just pow. So mm -hmm. I went, okay, Russ got me on a level that I never heard anybody get me. And that was why I knew I was in the hands of somebody not only so respectful, but insightful. And it's hard to explain what a producer does, but they take you by that invisible world of intention to the 
the place you couldn't go on your own. Because as you said, I've done a lot of different things on my own and with a few producers, but this kind of love takes you to some other place entirely. So I just wanted to, if Russ doesn't make it here, <laughs> it's okay uh, it's... because he, you know, when he's in the studio, he definitely knows what he's doing. So Company was the only song of that ilk. When I, would, when I was writing with the, my co-writer there, Alfred Johnson, I was thinking I might have a career as a songwriter. I didn't know that um, that I'd get a big break and get to be a singer. So I wrote that with Frank Sinatra in mind. And um, when I met Lenny and Russ, and and um, and at the time, um, sorry, I don't like sitting here. And at the time, the president of Warner Brothers, Mo Austin. They actually flew to the desert and took that song to a little unknown thing, took that song to Frank Sinatra. And they came back and said, you know, he just, he can't sing that stuff anymore. Because <laughs> that's a really hard song to sing. So, um, so f there is something full circle. It's inexplicable though, isn't it? I don't know how or why, but I can feel that at last, I've landed in, I've, at last I've landed again. I have, um, and I'm not gonna say more than that because uh, because words don't explain it, but you can feel it, right? So it's a great piece. Oh yeah. And, and I'm here again. So. So, so the one thing that was, was obvious to me as a listener and a fan um, is this concept of a conversation. Um, I think one of the things that makes this album and many of your albums special is that I feel like you're, you're singing to me, you're talking to me, and also having a conversation with the other musicians. And I noticed in some of your notes, you, you echoed that sentiment. And, you know, for example, the thing that completely mesmerized me when I just started listening to your record was Mike Manieri's vibes. And yeah. I know, I've known Mike forever and i know you do too and i think he's absolutely wonderful i actually just talked to him about a year ago it's been, I, I need to call him um and and you hear that vibe and it's a conversation between you and mike he's not speaking in words you are but you're clearly understanding each other tell yeah. me how that works well he's anticipating uh, you know a syncopated thing that's coming and he play and he plays it before it gets there. It, this is the closest. <laughs> this is the closest I think a, a singer and a player have ever been. Everything I'm gonna do is set up by Mike, and then he also responds to it after the fact. And he's got his own, you know. He's got his own joyful character that he brought, as if he went. This is a little fun, sensual thing she's gonna do. I'm gonna, I'm gonna introduce her now. Here she comes. <laughs> it's kind of reminded me of the Jetsons. Forgive me for that, but it reminded <laughs> me of this happy time when we were kids, and or a soap commercial or something full of bright. Um, um, what are those called? Kid colors, primary colors. So, yeah. It, that's just my goofy mind, but it, it's an extraordinary track, yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and he, he's absolutely wonderful. And, and the, but all the musicians on the record, I mean, there, there's, there's this conversation. You know, one of the things that I've been working on in jazz is, is this upcoming issue about uh, duos and how the interaction between uh, recording and performing artists, and that interaction becomes so obvious on this record. Um, and the thing that I thought was really wonderful, and you kind of, you bring us back uh, a couple of decades, maybe 50 years, where they're shorter songs, they're incredibly meaningful, and I, I, I actually, I don't, I don't think I've come up with this word, but I was trying to think of a word to describe this album, and it's, it's your audio biography. It is, it is, it's a, a musical version of things that obviously you feel very passionate about that you've learned through life and you express them in song. 
Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so I, 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 I like to leave it open ended because one of the things that, you know, the lessons that we all learn in life, um, we go back and listen to those songs. I mean, most of us who have been studying music, listening to music, have heard most of, if not all, of these songs. Yes. But you bring new meaning to them as you breathe your life into them and you listen to them differently. And you listen to the words differently, even though they were written by the same writer. Um, there's something about the way you articulate it. How can you explain that? You know, it's better for people who explain things to explain it. But I know that whenever I sing any song, um, it's almost like it's a room. I see it intact, all that are living in it, who built it where it came from. So when I step into it, I'm part of a story that's already existed. I don't think most singers do this, but this is my relationship with anything that, um, that I sing. It, it just starts to build a room. So, um, so every song I sing, I have an imaginary world, a long history that that is either an imaginary history or a real one with the song like Sunny Side of the Street or something. So that's how I sing a song. And it, inexplicably, that's what you hear. That's what's that's what also um, it's just an unimpeded re emotional relationship. I know I'm talking to an audience, but I'm also talking to the imaginary person that the writer puts there in front of me, just in time. I found you just in time. Well, that imaginary person is there for anybody who sings the song, but not everybody envisions him or her and makes him as real as possible. In my case, you know, I'm 68 years old, so you better believe it's just in time. And it's kind of funny and, um, and all the things that I want to bring at my age to that song, to to um, so it's a complex it's a complex thing, and I'm glad that uh, it's still working. But but I guess that's the way I sing. I did want to comment on the two minute songs, on the three minute songs. So you know when you go hear jazz, everybody takes a solo. <laughs> Every single verse, somebody else takes a solo. And that was really interesting in 1940, you know, when you had extraordinary, not that there aren't great musicians now, but it was a new idea. And um, it is not a new idea today. I think when a, when, a, when a soloist plays, he has to be as compelling as a singer. He has to be telling a story as compelling as what just caught your attention. Otherwise, there's just no reason to put a solo in there. So these are short songs and I made the choice not to sing them again. I just went, here is what the, the writer had to say. We're gonna say it, we're out. Once or twice, we came back around to the refrain. Now you're here now. And Mike, you know, we had to let Mike play, <laughs> play the whole song. Mike. Um, but, I just didn't want to do that thing. I did an interesting thing, I think, with Here's That Rainy Day, where I brought the thing back in and then sang the end of the phrase, then let the player play and then sang the end of the phrase and brought it back in. So when I, when I, when we left space for it, um, but then as it turned out, so we recorded, you know, I, I don't like to tell too many secrets, but we recorded the tracks and left space in two of them for possible solos. But when we got there to put solos in, it was so false. Mm -hmm. I mean, and they're great players, but they had nothing to do with the energy of the room that day. And there was no way that we didn't, you know, it's not that we, you know, were attached to it as it was. We, you could tell this solo has nothing to do with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. What happens is people come in and they go, I love it when I play this thing, I'm going to play this thing. And you go, but that has nothing to do with it. 
So it's very hard to find. So even if you do find somebody who listens and goes, oh, this solo should only be four notes. And that's all they played. It just, it didn't work because it wasn't live. So we end up with long spaces that have no solo and it's wonderful. It's just, space. it's just, uh, that keeps this sensual vibe between everybody. So yeah, the two minute thing was purposeful, three minutes. And so consequently the overall length of the record is a little shorter, but it, but it's a record of, of 10 songs as it should be. And, and, and you're singing. I wanted to comment on something that I've noticed over the years with singers, singers that we loved in their early years, that um, it's not like we fall out of love with their singing, but um, I guess to sugarcoat it, some singers we wish they stopped singing and because we want to remember them when they were great singers. You, on the other hand, yeah. your singing voice has evolved. When I first listened to your voice, you had a, a lack of, for a better, like a, almost a childish, this innocent, yet we knew that you were this tough kid, but you had this innocent voice, which was quite a paradox. Now, you're a little bit older, your voice is older, but you still maintain that childishness in some way. And it comes through in the music, and it actually sounds better. Yeah. Thank you. And I think Russ picked up on that immediately and put that out front. Well, to be honest, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. You know, I've been working live for many years, and I noticed about three years ago that the top of the range was a struggle. And then the mid-high was dissolving. And I was going, oh, how will I ever sing jazz again? But um, but what happened was I began to practice, <laughs> which I never had to do before. So I began to, you know, work that muscle and identify where it struggles and find another way around it. And in this jazz record, the minute that I started singing, it seemed that I brought all knowledge to bear to make it easy and you know, it sounds really easy, but I was working. <laughs> to, oh, I bet. Hard at, to make it easy and hit all the notes and not slide up to the notes and, and uh, make it just as strong as it could be. So I did it. But yeah, I You did it. And, and, but you did something that I think all great recording and performing artists do, and that is you make it look easy. Yet if you really understand music, you understand how hard it is to get there. Yes. And, and, um, and, and you did it. So Thanks. when you, going back again to your debut album, you, you out of the box became really kind of a, mu a music icon. Um, that had to have some serious consequence for you at 24 years old. You're thrusting onto the scene. You're at this record company who, that was at what I believe was their heyday. Yeah. You know, when, when, when Mo and Lenny and Russ were doing their thing back at Warner Brothers, it never, it never was better than that. It's never been better since. Um, what was it like to be this young woman on this? In other words, I guess what I'm getting at, did you ever feel as a young artist that these are just a bunch of record company guys trying to tell me what to do? Or did you have faith back then because of the way the business was so much different then than it is now? I hadn't really assessed anything business. You know, I knew I thought the Rolling Stone was kind of snobby, but that was as far into that, that water that I, that I put my toe. So when I was signed by a record company that, that with people I, whose names I knew because of their association with my idols, like Randy Newman, so I knew Lenny and Russ, when they embraced me, I found a family. So I never saw them as record company guys. I saw them as an extension of my own family. I would go to Warner Brothers every day and walk around and say hello to everybody. I'm not getting, I had nothing else to do. And that's probably the best thing an artist could do. But 
and I'd go sit in Lenny's, Lenny's office or Mo's office, just sit to wait to talk to them because I guess I didn't have much of a, you know, I'd left my mother up in Washington. So they became my family. And um, I never, until the end, which happened after Bob Regeer died. And that was so emotional for me and um, and overwhelming that, that that I think, and Lenny and Russ had moved on. They didn't want to produce my next record for whatever reason. Then I I knew I was I was done there. But until that happened, they were they were my family, and never ever did they try to interfere with my vision. All they wanted to do was bring it bring whatever it was I wanted to do to the to the vinyl. Yeah, that was great. The um, do do you and don't take this the wrong way. But do you think that you're an easier person today than you were back? Yeah. In every in the way, early days. Yeah, I well, <clears throat> there's two people. There's the the little girl I was before I was signed, and then mm -hmm. the the woman I became right after I was signed. Which you know, the girl I was before really wanted to succeed, but mm -hmm. I must have been charming enough to bring people to me to help me do that. After I was signed and vulnerable and innocent. But after I was signed and so much power and to be clear, drugs and the loss of my love affair and then eventually the loss of my Warner's family made me a very, not just cranky, but what's the word, you know, self-important. Just, I had all the, I think, maybe not all, but all the things you hope a person doesn't become when they have wealth and fame, I became. Remember when Kanye West jumped on the stage and said that girl couldn't have her Grammy? I was just that far from that guy. Wow. I was so important that everybody wants to know what I have to say. I know what's best for everybody. Well, I, I was, you know, I didn't jump on any stages, but I could, when he did that, I went, oh my God, I, I know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, help him, help him, help the bombardier. So, um, that was, that was really a hard, you know, and I wish that, what do I wish? I'm not sure how I could have, you know, I'm kind of kind now, and I recognize the other in the room. That took a long time to get there because I was so full of my own sorrow and pain and and then importance, but but but, but in the interior thing, just a lot of you know old old childhood stuff in there. So that took a long time before. It's just as simple as saying, I'm done with that. It, it, no big thing has to happen. I'm done with that. Who are you? How can I help you? It takes years to get there. But once you do that, you can really have a lot of power. Um, and, and, um, and that power goes into your work because you're always aiming at the other. Um, when I'm singing... I guess all those things come into play. You know, I'm thinking only of myself because I'm thinking of the sound of my voice and how I have to control every little thing. I'm thinking of the text of the song. I'm thinking of the drummer, how sweet he is. Listen to what he's trying to do. I'm thinking, I'm thinking of everything until it's just a blank canvas. And um, it's a mystical thing, but if you don't have for whatever reason, if kindness isn't part of your vocabulary and compassion, well, we just won't hear it in what you're saying. And, and that's okay. But um, that's what you're hearing. You're hearing a lot of, um, I think, a lot of happiness, a lot of very personal. I feel something, you know, besides the being right up on the mic, I feel something very very personal in how um, I'm delivering. Hi, Russ, how I'm delivering. Hi, Ricky. 
<laughs> you have no Harris, idea. Thanks had for to go to get on. <laughs> I'm so well, glad. Well, you're here. Yeah. <laughs> and there's the green well, wall. The green wall. And there's the, the green wall. wall. <laughs> we saw Ricky's green wall. We saw your green wall. I feel yeah. left out. I do not have a green wall. You know, we um, can well later it, tell you what the, what, what the color is. <laughs> well, Ricky and I are having a, a wonderful conversation, and we've talked about you, but we haven't had a chance yet to talk to you. And one of the things I was going to ask early on uh, in you guys are truly friends. I mean, it, it's it's not just oh, yeah. you're not just music collaborators and. And how does that work? I mean, you know, they always say, you know, don't go into business with friends or, you know, whatever the vernacular is, but you seem to do it well. Well, uh, uh, I think it speaks for itself. We just, we've known each other for so long and we stayed friends, even, even when there were long periods of not communicating. Um, but when we do, it's like, you know, family, it's like, you know, getting back together with your, you know, your closest person. Um, so, and, and the business doing business with someone, it's funny. Um, I used, uh, what's his name? Jonathan, you know, the guy who does all the Sondheim, uh, orchestrations, Jonathan, uh, not, uh, not Taplin. Uh, I'll look it up. <laughs> Sound thanks, Ricky. Works. But anyway, go forward. And then so, we'll... so he told when I went over to to discuss the, uh, I got him to do a couple of arrangements for me. And when I went over there to his place, you know, he had all this memorabilia and cards, and he and he showed me a card, a Christmas card from Sondheim to him, that said, "Nice doing business with you." <laughs> Jonathan Larson. Huh? Jonathan Larson. No. No, not really. Arranger. That later who he was. So I think with, so, with Russ and I, we made these two records that, as you said, were were beautiful records and important at the time. Yeah. Pirates was a was almost like going into an archaeological dig of <laughs> my emotions <laughs> and coming yeah. back alive again. Yeah. And, um, so I think when you've done something like that together, there's a bond, there's a familiarity that, that never goes away. And especially if Russ gets to see that 20 years later, I've found my way out of the dark hole. And, you know, he's known lots of musicians. I'm certainly not the worst of anybody he's known. Come <laughs> on. Well, but, but also, also in the '90s, um, we did a live record together, and, that, and that's when it was just the two of us doing it. And uh, Ricky called me and asked me to help her do it. And she sent me; she had recorded all this stuff, and she sent it to me. And I listened to it, and I said, "Okay, we don't have a We Belong Together. We don't have a Chuckies in Love, and we don't have a something else. I don't remember what it was." I said, "So you have to do t another show or two." And, and we'll get those things. And that's exactly what we did. We went to, you went to some San Francisco somewhere uh -huh. and, and did two shows and we got those pieces and then we mixed it. It was like really an easy thing. I think there was one thing you did overdubs on, not much, you know? Um, and that was a great experience for us. It was, it, it went very, you know, it was simple. And because of the nature of, you know, it was just you on either guitar or piano. Yeah. Except for the one thing with Rob, the bass thing. Um, but that was, I think that was kind of a, a little turning point or something that, that allowed us to work together. And, you know, there was not a lot of charge on the thing. Yeah. And, and you know, Ricky and I were talking about the, the, uh, you're, you, you obviously, you've, Russ, you've produced some amazing pop records. I mean, two of my favorite James Taylor albums you produced, October Road and Gorilla. Oh, and you. yet you have this understanding of jazz and jazz musicians. And, and we, Rick and I were talking about this, that 
you know, back then, especially in the early days, the first two records, there was this thing going on with these great jazz musicians from producers who understood what those musicians could bring to the table. Yeah. And, and obviously you did it on this record, although the conversation is so much more intimate on this record. Um, where did you, I mean, everyone knows you as, as a producer and a songwriter, and I heard you're a pretty good guitar player too. Uh, yeah. and, and, and where did that come from? For me, well, my parents, it came from my parents who had the best taste in music. They weren't musicians. My mother could read and play piano. We had the Fireside Folk Song book. All the commies had it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, and it had folk songs on it and, and, um, and, and political songs. Freiheit, this German anti-war, World War I song, and Los Cuatro mm -hmm. Generales, which was Spanish Civil War song. Um, and, and, the, and the arrangements were nice, you know, so she could read and play and we'd stand around and sing those songs. But their record collection was Louis Armstrong, Ella Fitzgerald, Harry James, Dinah Shore, uh, the Almanac singers, Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie, wow. the Weavers, uh, the Red Army Choir. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, my father's favorite piece of music was Beethoven's Fifth Piano Concerto. Arthur Rubinstein, and, mm -hmm. and uh, so that music was going in the house all the time. And my mother loved Louis Jordan, so yeah. mm -hmm. you know, come on. So so there yeah, was so that that, that was in your blood, in my blood from and Lead Belly. The most important thing to me was Lead Belly mm -hmm. when I was two and three years old. That was just, I'd just sit and listen to that thing over and over and over again. I just want to say this that it's so important to note that our generation and a little bit after us has such a diverse education because our parents brought jazz, yeah. but we're hearing black music and white music on the radio together, which hadn't really happened before. We're hearing, you know, what was soul and stuff. Uh, Russ has this folk commie background, which I didn't have. But uh, so when we come, we have such an education. Yeah. And to market the record, it's got to go in jazz or rock or pop. But that's not the impetus that we come from. We, we just come from a love of music. Yeah, that's it. And, and the radio, I'm 10 years older than you. But so when I was a kid, my older sister, all of her friends were listening to all the doo-wop records. Yeah. So that was that was it for me, you know, and then the and then pop radio had anything that was good that was selling was on the radio. There was and, they, you know, there was an R&B station, which I listened to as a kid all the time, KGFJ in L.A. Um, but, you know, Sam Cooke, any any, you know, hit doo wop record or or, you know, Whispering Bells, the, the you know, the Dell Vikings and. All these people, and that, and that was, you know, and then Dion comes and all the rest of the other stuff. Mm -hmm. So, so that that was our, that was what we grew up with, and the stuff that we loved, which which included all that. Like when you think about those records that were made uh, back then, all of these, all the musicians on those records were the great jazz players. So you wonder why the thing swings so hard. Why do fools fall in love? And you know, these records just swung like crazy. Yeah. 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 The, the, um, Ricky and I were talking about this earlier, and that is there are a lot of singers that are technically wonderful, um, mm. but they don't breathe life into the song. They don't really, they don't make the song their own. They're, they're quite competent in singing them, and the musicians are stellar. Mm. But you just don't get that same feeling that you get on, like you do on this record, where yeah, you just, record. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, the, the thing that I, I think, for me as, as a listener that I love about a record is, you know, you mentioned earlier that these are shorter songs and the, the total length of the album is short. Yeah. It leaves you wanting more. Um, and I think that's what makes sometimes a really great record. When you get done with the album and you're like, I could listen to that again. Yeah. 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 I agree. You know, the other thing is that it, it was a choice I think that we made that we didn't take a lot of repeats. A lot of people take mm -hmm. repeats, you know, like all the way, boom, that's it, you know, and then it's over and, and it's all in the game, you know, and all of these things were, so it's all stripped down. 
And it allowed Ricky to do the thing that she does the best, uh, which is which is to bring this other thing to, you know, I, I think I think that uh, I think that uh, you as an artist, I, I think what what we what we managed to do, I think, was to choose songs that allowed you to do the thing that you do on your own material. So that, you know, the vocal performance on company, which comes from another galaxy. Um, so to you, tell a story, maybe. Yeah, it's telling a story, but you get to that place in you that, I mean, I think, it, yeah. I, I don't know anyone else who does that. <laughs> You know, I, I have a, a funny Ricky story. Ricky, I hope you like this story. Um, so I'm going to pull it up on screen. You may remember this, but back in the early 90s, how do I pull this up? Uh, add to stream. We featured you, Ricky, on the cover of Jazz's magazine. Mention this all in the game song when you're done. Yes, please go. I'm ready. And, and um, when was this? And when was did, this was, I want to say, Maybe nine. This was for the pop pop record. Yeah. Oh, right. Two ninety three. Wow. Yes. What a fabulous and um, and so so th this is photographer Jeff Sedlick, and I know you've been shot by the greatest photographers in the world, Andy Leibovitz for Rolling Stone. Jeff, as you may know, his work. He he did that famous shot of Miles Davis with his finger to his mouth. Yeah, and uh, and Jeff's just a wonderful LA photographer uh, who we've, he's right. been working with us for years, and he told me a story about you at this photo session, which really epitomized you and you as an artist, full circle beyond music, and that is Jeff is a very studied, very serious photographer. Usually, before he goes into a photo shoot, he's drawn sketches, he's figured out lighting, he's got assistants, wardrobe, makeup whatever brings the whole entourage and you came to the photo session and he starts telling you okay so i want you to do this and this and this and you just looked at him and you said okay let me tell you how this is going to work you do your thing i'm going to do my thing if you catch my thing during your thing it'll be great if not i don't know what to tell you <laughs> and you did your thing and not only was this an absolutely stunning cover photo, but the inside photography was also brilliant. Ricky Lee doing her thing. Yeah. And so I get it. <laughs> and I'll leave. I'll, I'll... <laughs> I just made this. That's exactly how we made this record. You know, um, I'm so a good just to mention all in the game real fast. If I could. Okay. Oh. That's a good one to, to use to illustrate this point. So all in the game is almost a dead song because it was done mm -hmm. so definitively in the 50s by the vocal group, right? Yeah. And that's what we think. Miniati has to fall. Yeah. And I, but I, I was, I must have heard it. I don't know what, but I, I know Van Morrison's version and he, you know, and gets himself into a thing. But I thought my father had told me incorrectly, like the postmaster general or something had written this song, but it was a political guy who wrote this one song, uh, the lyric, way back at the turn of the century, I think I looked it up. And that always intrigued me how a non-musician understood it was almost as if he was speaking to his daughter. Yes, yeah. no. Who was so. He wrote the melody. That he wrote the melody. Song. Where does that? So who wrote the the lyric? Then is really old. Carl Sigmund wrote the lyric in 1951. Oh, okay. So the lyric came later. All right. Yes. Got you. So the lyric always seemed like to me that it was a, a fatherly figure saying. I know you're you're but hold on. Right. Wait. At the at the moment when you most cannot wait, you know, you're gonna fall at the door and or gut your wrist or you're gonna take action. This thing is saying don't take action. Wait and it will be beautiful. All you hope it will be. 
Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I get so touched by the lyrics. So when we went to sing it, and it wasn't like I was having any broken heart thing or anything. It, it, everything was okay. But I know how that feels. So I said, it has to be very, very slow. I want every word that we're saying to be felt so slow that the listener goes, uh, <laughs> very slow. Yeah. Because that's the only way but we're going to wring out the old version and, and make you surrender to, um, to what's happening here. Yeah. And um, for me, it was very moving. It's, it's, and and, it, and there's a it, there's it, a song, it, one of the songs on the record, I can hear you sniffle. You're, you're, yeah, I can hear you like. One. It's that one. Yeah, that, yeah. yeah. And, and I was like, this is real. This is yeah. real. This is, this is, that's why it, it's so much of a conversation. It's, it's, it's hearing you as you. And that comes through in this record. Uh, from, you know from what, beginning to end. That, that happened on more than one song. It, okay. It's not sadness. It's just such deep emotion that I'm going to, to tell you the story that, um, that yet many of the songs ended in me sobbing, I remember. Now. Yeah. It was, it was a lot of work. <laughs> it, it was a lot of work. But I, <laughs> and, I, and I, you know, I get asked about it now. And, and I say, it's like working with like the greatest actor in the world. You know, she manages to get to go to that place, you know, and then be able to express it. It is like acting. Yeah. It's like acting. Yeah. Michael said really amazing. Russ, what's your about the record before you came on? That what? Michael said really amazing things about the record before uh -huh. you came on. Oh. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's really a, it, it, it's a work of art. The um, Russ, what do you like most about producing? Yes. Hmm. Did you hear him? Oh yeah. Yeah, I heard him. Okay. What a question! <laughs> I, I I love everything about it. Um, uh, you know, working with her is it, it's different than anybody else um but you know it, it's a matter of of you know lenny used to say it the first thing is you have to be a good editor and you have to be a great listener so and that i think is what what happened with us on this record you know i just uh, i know i know your you know i i know what you do and and so it was my job to really to listen and to be there with you while you were doing it and often to just stay out of the way, you know, and then, and then, you know, I suppose uh, uh, the only thing I can think about that maybe was, you know, uh, we went down the road on a couple of songs that, that wasn't working and, <laughs> And, and because I was, you know, I, I'm the person who sits back and listens. And, like, w w and we gave them all, like, a really good shot. And, and then I'd go, you, you know, this isn't working. Let's let's go on to the next thing. Yes. You know? <laughs> and, yeah. And, we, you know, we have enough trust with each other. So she'd fire we, we hit the We hit the vein so well that on some days in that one week, we were recording three songs a day. Absolutely. Yeah. It was amazing. Yeah. So, we, like, we cut fifteen songs in five days. Ten wow. of them. Ten of them are on the record, yeah. and and then we had, you know, uh, um, you know, um, the the extra track. Yeah, That's, yeah, yeah. It we, never entered my mind. It never mean? entered my mind, which we both loved and we wanted to have on the record. But I guess you know it just didn't fit. But we have three versions of it, and all of them are really good. So, yeah. I was it looking was for that track because I, I saw your description of it, but I, I couldn't find it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, well, we're putting one out. You know, the Japanese always want to be have a special track. Bonus so track. <laughs> they get a special track. But then we'll have two others that will eventually unfold, and yeah. all three of them are, are really beautiful. Yeah, really. And you did the, you know. That, that was another experience that I was so thrilled with. Um, 
R Ricky, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we started to do overdubs and she'd go, oh, give me a track. And she'd go out and like put a part down, you know, and then another one and then another one. And then all of a sudden this choir appears <laughs> that also comes from out, outer space. It's not like anybody else's approach to putting vocals, mm -hmm. you know, a vocal group on the thing. It's just from another planet. And and then it would just it would just happen, you know. I don't know. The only other time I ever had an experience. Yeah. Well, a miniature has to fall has a has a choir that yeah that starts to come in yeah. The, 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 it, I do feel them, but I know I don't plan it, so I know yeah. once I go in to do it, they'll all they'll all be there. Yeah, but they're on a couple of other songs, you know. The, yeah. They come in. It's just so, man. You know. I mean, the only other yeah, time, it, it's... the only other time I ever experienced anything like that was when I worked with Brian Wilson, and he had an idea for something, and he said, "You know, give me a track." And he's going along, and 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 Milton Nascimento too. The, those two, where they start, they put something down, and then it goes, and like it sounds just awful, and then the, like this other part comes in and. Bang! There it is. You know, <laughs> you know. How could you not do great work with a person like this, listening and appreciating everything that you do? <laughs> That's yeah. love. Well, that's that, about the best that we have. It's, yeah, somebody there to hear it. Yeah. And she's so funny. You know, like she'd start doing something, and I, I can remember a couple of times I'd, I'd say. You know, what if you, and you, you'd say, look, just let me do this. <laughs> and, then, and then I'd go, oh, right, okay. You know, and so then she'd do it, and, you know, then I get to comment later. Later. <laughs> right. What happening? Stay out of her way. Like the photographer. Let me do my thing. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. Let me do my thing. Yeah. The, uh, so, so I think in, in the annals of recording, um, I'm sticking my neck out a little bit, but this is this is Ricky and Russ's kind of blue. This is this is the wow. album that people are are going to listen to for years and say there's just something about the vibe of this album that I'm just going to put on every time I feel in that mood. Yeah, good. What, what a compliment. That's our job. Yeah. That's our job. Yeah. Thank you so much. You said everything thank you. I would to hear about the record. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, man. Well, thank you for putting it all down on the record for all of us to enjoy. Mm -hmm. We had uh, fun. Again, we I had hope fun we'll... making this record. Yes, we I did. could tell. We wow. have a little list for a possible other one. We'll see what happens. Maybe we can do it a little bit different, um, but the same. Yeah. <laughs> It's not in your nature to do the same thing twice. <laughs> thank you, guys. That sounds, thank you very much. Take care. Nice talking to you. Mm -hmm.